How do you know that you can fix all this, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> we're all getting ahead of you. We're going into this detail. Uh, you know? Yeah, well. Why? <laughs> we can't stay the horses. We can't stay the horses. Is it recording? It's recording. Okay. Yeah,
know you're in trouble again, I'm sure. <laughs> Painted myself into a corner. Yeah, it, that happens a lot. <laughs> However, we'll we'll press on with the next phase here anyway, so I think uh, what we're going to do actually next is to start painting in the cliff reflections of the cliff down in the water. Uh, to do that, I'm going to put one more dark area up here because you, you have to know what's happening up in the cliffs before you can paint the reflections down below. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and put in these darks. It won't take too long. And you all know the routine. I do these big puddles and then I make the details at the edge Can with a little brush. Do I'm doing it right now. Um, you use a brush big enough to get a lot of paint on the paper and a lot of water. And you hold paper flat because you're going to put so much paint on there it will drip if you tilt it in. paint's a little hard so far, so it's going to take a minute to get enough on the paper. And in the shadow areas, I'm generally using the three primary colors because if you, if you add blue and burnt sienna in the shadows, it tends to make that ugly black, which a few people have gotten, kind of a greenish gray black. And you want to avoid that. You want to keep the interior of the shadows fairly lively. So it's the yellow that you were using then? I'm using yellow, yeah. Because I'm, I'm trying, trying to keep the colors a little more saturated and brighter. And, bur well, Bersian is worse because it has quite a bit of, of a black hue in it. Raw Sienna does also. So I'm trying to use the clearest yellow I have. Since I know it's basically going to be very thick paint in here. Um, and I generally go towards the purplish. Okay, I, want, I think, I'm not sure what color I have there. I need to be careful. Looks like I had some fellow blue, so I want to avoid that. It's ultramarine. Anyway, I've got plenty of paint over here now. I overdid that a little. Since this is a demonstration, I can I can do that. Uh, I'm going to use a medium-sized brush now to get the rough shape of this. Okay, I'm doing this area over in here now. If you can all see back there, um, is the is the reference photo on the camera now? Oh, it is. I can see it. Well. Okay, now you can see it, right? This area in here. As I said, I'm, I'm laying the painting flat. Because there's so much paint on there, it would just drip off if I tilted it. I'm going to go ahead and spread that paint around. And when I do, you'll notice it starts to look thinner. So I'm going to have to add colors as I go along. Now, a lot of people have had to go back in and, for instance, if you've had that sort of grayish green, uh, black looking shadow, uh, people have had to go in and lift to then later on put in warmer, later areas inside the shadow. That's okay, but it's a little more efficient to just go ahead and do it when you're starting out uh, by dripping in the appropriate colors and not making it black in the first place. Now, in spite of the fact that I had a lot of paint on there, you notice by the time I'm spreading it around, it's already starting to dry out. So I'm going to add it even more. Now, if you want to get water out of the thing, if you do this, you're wiping all the water off the brush. So I like to go ahead and have the brush full of stuff. I just don't carry it over the sky or the water. But you're not getting a background though? Excuse me? You're not getting backgrounds and blooms? Okay. Well, I am, but I haven't taken it all the way out to the edges of this wash Oh, yet I see. Either. Okay, so, so you can push it out. It doesn't matter. I'm going to okay. be pushing it around. 
Right now, I'm still in the process of adding paint. Well, thank <coughs> Excuse you. me. This is actually quicker. I mean, the reason I do this this way, a lot of it is just speed. Uh, you don't realize uh, how long you take doing it the way you do this sort of to do, 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 do you know. Um, you also gain a degree of, uh, of consistency in your shadow. You do. Freshness. Instead of micromanaging right. it, and then you're trying to go back, oh, that one looks different now. And right. Uh, right. Plus, you can do it sort of on the fly. In other words, when you're painting the shadow a little piece at a time, you, yeah. know, you paint a little bit and then a little bit more, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, you have no control later on when you get the whole thing there. A lot of times when you get an entire section of the picture with paint on it, it looks different than when you were painting a little bit at a time. That's the trouble. I'm this is a way of doing the whole thing at once so you have a chance to see it sitting there on the paper about the shape it's supposed to be. And then you realize, okay, it's too dark, it's too light, it's, it's too orange, too blue, whatever. And you can go ahead and change it while it's on the paper, while it's fresh in your mind. You don't have to go back later on and realize, oh, now that I've got the whole thing painted, it's not what I wanted. I've changed this a little bit. This uh, should have gone higher up, this light area. In fact, I can go back and change that um, just as a demonstration. Since it's so wet, mm -hmm. I can change it now just by doing this and blotting it up. Wow. Okay. It's a lot better than scrubbing. Yeah. Now, when you do that, you kind of have to let it sit a little for this interior area to dry out enough that the paint's not creeping in. If you were to look at this closely now, the paint is starting to creep back in where I blotted it. But it won't get that far. It'll sort of bloom in towards that, and then later on I can go in and correct those edges. But that's actually much better than lifting. It's quicker. It doesn't disturb the paper as much. And although it seems like this is taking a long time, it's really a lot quicker than when you do it a little piece at a time. Uh, the problem is a lot of people enjoy doing that a little piece at a time, and time really flies when you're having fun. And they don't realize that they've spent a half an hour or 45 minutes just fiddling with something, and that they've brushed the paper a million times, and that the paper's getting tired and screaming at them because it's damp all that time. Um, I really have not put a lot of brush strokes on the paper. And that's another thing that I'm, I'm trying to get people to do is to get away from this little, even, even people trying to put big washes on the paper, they have a tendency to do it this way, just over and over and over and over and over. I mean, you all know, everybody who's doing it knows. And I would like fewer, longer, more controlled strokes. The thing about this sort of reflexive twitchy brush thing is that you you don't really have a lot of control. You think you do, but you're not paying a lot of attention. If you actually do, you know, one long stroke towards you this way, that way, and practice the motions, you have a lot more control over what you're doing with the brush. Uh, plus, you get a different texture on the painting. Um, you know, the, the Chinese and the, ja the Orientals in general are very big on that sort of practice, you know. I mean, Chinese brush painting has X number and types of strokes, sort of almost calligraphy strokes, and they'll have you practice it, you know, a thousand times or whatever. That's not a bad thing. Uh, it really is true that you need to learn to handle the brush. A lot of times I can look at, a, at a, somebody's painting, even if I haven't seen the picture, and I can tell which hand they've used and how they've held the brush. Because every stroke on the picture is curved with a certain radius and then a certain direction. If they're left-handed, they curve this way. If they're right-handed, they curve this way. Mm -hmm. If they hold the brush out here, they curve on a big radius. If they hold the brush up here, they curve a little. Mm -hmm. And so you see these, all these thousands of little comma-shaped things all over the picture. And that's how they've painted the picture, is all these little strokes. And the problem is the entire picture begins to have the exact same texture everywhere. 
and you're losing half of the weapons that you could have in a watercolor to show what's happening. You really like to have a, a different texture by having different painting techniques and different brush strokes. Um, Are you uh, talking so that the paint will soak in? I was waiting for this little area to okay. dry. I remember okay. I said it was going to spread. Um, okay, now it's, it's pretty wet, possibly even wetter than I want, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of some. Okay, now it's not too grippy, and I can actually, you know, start to tilt it around without everything running off. It's very dark up in here, so I'm going to add some paint, because mine looks kind of wimpy up there. And I better hurry up on this, because I do want to get to the water that was on schedule for today. That is the ultramarine blue. <coughs> now, as I said, I'm not going to put uh, burnt sienna in there yet. Later on, if I want a real black, black color, I could put some burnt sienna in as an afterthought, but I don't have to do it right now. So that was just straight blue you added? That was straight blue, and now I'll add some straight red. That's the other thing. See, I can adjust the color by dropping it in one color at a time, and it's so wet that they mix, they'll mix they mix up on the paper. Uh, and this is a dark area, so I can be fairly uh, cavalier about adding big globs of paint and then spreading them around. Although it's still not thick the way, you know, some people, they get the very, very sort of thick paint that collects at the edges, and that's because there's not enough water. I have a lot of paint and a lot of water, and it still actually will run a little bit. And the difference happens when it gets to the point where the paper is just damp, and it has this sort of sludge on it, and you, then you're moving it with the brush. Now it will still move with gravity and this sort of capillary action creeping that happens. Uh, it's actually the... Uh, the natural movement of the paint rather than using my brush to shove it everywhere. So I always have hard edges. You mean I have too much pigment then in my paint? Too many... uh, I'm not sure what you mean by hard edges. That's yeah, a, so a terminology as dries, question. Okay, these edges are very sharp. Yeah, but I have more what? pigment at the edge there. Okay, yeah. well, I would call those heavy edges. Okay. Actually, I call them ugly edges, but I didn't want to. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> that's what I'm asking. Um, more paint there than in and that's because what happens, if I could make one right now, although I'll have to no, fix no, no, it later, is you keep adding stuff in the middle like this. I'll do this, and uh, then I'll, I'll start adding paint, and I'll think, when you put water in the middle, all of a sudden it sort of spreads out, and then it looks lighter oh. in the middle, and you think, oh, I need more paint. You put more paint on, you do it again. You can never get that middle dark that way, because when you put it in, you're brushing it away from the center. So it just keeps going the outside, yeah. oh, and okay, it's yeah. it's not doing it by itself. You're so it's pushing the it. Fussing there. in yeah. the middle. Okay. And so the, the solution is keep it wet enough that the paint runs around by itself, and you're not moving it with a brush. All you're supposed to do with a brush is change the edges. Okay. In other words, I get that edge outline, and then from then on, the paint should be wet enough that I can drop it in and just kind of run it around. I shouldn't have to do a lot of brushing. You should be able to count your brush strokes, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six in a given area. And, you know, and if you work your way up to 10,000, you know you're doing it wrong. But when you decided it wasn't dark enough, you did add ultramarine blue, because that's what I'm trying to do. Yes. But you didn't, you just added wet. it and let it run. I added it and I let it run. I okay. mean, I can, if it's not running enough, I can give it a couple shoves with a brush, but if I count 20, then I know it's too right. thick. I yeah. need more water. So what if you had gotten it too dry by the time you figured out that you wanted to add your ultramarine blue? And then washed it out. How I'd, have, fix that? I'd have added some water out near the edge. Uh -huh. In other words, and that's why I made this thing a little smaller than I wanted in the first place, because suppose I wanted to add some ultramarine or some red or whatever up here. Uh, and I say, okay, it's, it's already getting a little too thick. Uh, I would get my red and a little bit of ultramarine, you know, some purple, 
and I would add it out at the edge, actually a little bit outside of where I was out here, and then I'd add some water out here, and that pushes the paint back in. Okay, you can yeah, see yeah. it move this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So and if it's not, yeah. then I can yeah. do this and make sure it runs that way. Okay. If you add it in the middle and you shove it out, then you're going to yeah, get those yeah. ugly edges. And that's, everybody gets them. I get them myself sometimes and I have to fix them. So you have to know how to fix them. And usually the simple way, if you haven't overworked the paper, is you just lay some water on there, wait about a minute and a half, and then you take a paper towel and squish it down, and you can actually see that line print out on a paper towel. There may be a little bit left, but generally that's the way it works. Now, if I were to go back and try to soften this edge now, uh, it would run too far. It's still too wet. In other words, if I put, let me pick a place right here, Okay, there's sort of a flat area on this rock here that faces partly away from the sun. It, it has a glancing sun on it. So if I wanted some color, color to go down in there, I could take just a brush with just water, okay? And it also has a few cracks in there, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, now this is just water. That color is coming from up here, all right? So I could do this. And the paint in here is going to run out into that other area. And pretty soon it's going to go so far that it's all, it'll be almost uniform tone from here to there. You notice how fast this is spreading? Mm -hmm. And I just had, as I said, I had no color on the brush. That's strictly coming from the original wash. I just had water. Now, I don't want to actually try to do the, the softening of the edges in a more subtle way here because I know if I put water out here, the, the paint's just going to run into it. And that's how, as I'm painting this, if I start getting one of those heavy edges, I just run a little bead of water right outside of it and touch it to it, and then it all spreads in both directions, and that heavy line is gone before it really starts. But your rock gets bigger. The what, excuse me? The rock gets bigger. The shadow gets bigger. Yeah. The rock gets, well, the shadowed area, the rock gets bigger, yeah. Um, so anyway, that's that. And then there's another little area over here that I probably won't put in just yet because... Um, but you have to be careful that this is not too wet or it'll go that way. It'll bloom. You just Only if this is too dry to start with. And then... Okay. Okay. Yeah, if, if this is real dry, in other words, if it's not shiny, I can, I can hold this up and I can see the, the shininess all over this. Mm -hmm. That tells me it's not too dry. It's not going to bloom back into there. Now, at some point I may want it to bloom, okay? Down in here it's starting to dry out, and if I decided, okay, I want this area to be lighter, you don't... Uh, you want a little bit of texture in the rock, and this rock tends to be layered. So a lot of times if I want to go in and I want to lighten up an area, I'll, I'll deliberately bloom it this way. I'll do with some, just take some water in there and put some brush strokes. I'm not adding any paint. Okay, and that'll bloom a little bit, but it'll be a good looking bloom because it blooms where and when I intended it to. Um, if you put in your shadows in real high contrast, no blending at all, and it's drying out, to get those medium tones on on that on shaded edge. side of the rock, could you just go in with a, a new wash? No. Oh. You wait until it's almost dry. What if it is dry, like this morning? It could be perfectly dry, completely dry, okay. uh, and you can still go back in and soften it. I'll show you uh, if I have the hair dryer. Um, it's right here. <clears throat> You're still pulling paint out of the original yeah. darts. So when you want to do your little things that you did have done here, you still want the water that you have to be shiny? You want it to be just 
becoming unshiny. Now, the cord is across your foot, so when you move, I think it, be careful. That's okay. Uh, just as it's losing that shininess is when it's going to bloom. And when you bloom things deliberately, it's good to know that that's what's happening. Okay, this is dry. I dried it with a hair dryer. All right. We're okay with that. And uh, as long as you haven't overworked it too much, you can go back in here like this. It is a flat brush, and I'm, I'm kind of running it along that original edge. I'm not really scrubbing it, but I'm kind of wiping it a little bit. And I can, I can pull paint out, or if I have, a say, a crack in rock, I could push it back in like this. Okay. And so you can actually sort of sculpt the edge after it's dry. Uh, because the paint re-dissolves. The only time, as I said, when you can't do that, and uh, people who are having a lot of problems that way, is because they've done so many brush strokes on the paper when it's damp that they, the pigment has ground down into the paper so far that you can't move it anymore. It, I mean, you can put a lot of water on it and it'll dissolve, but it's so far ground down into those little pores that it can't come back out. And so you, just so much of this is water. I mean, you're deciding yeah. where the pigment ends right. up. That's why, why they, that's why they call it watercolor. Hurting it with <laughs> water. I mean, you're just yeah, basically... Exactly, you know. It's interesting. It moves where the water wants it to move. So it's you're controlling in, the water yeah, as it's, much as you are the pigment. It's... The water is... Well, yeah. It's, it, it, the, the water controls the pigment, and you hopefully will control the water where it goes, okay? Interesting. Uh, now, when the paper's fairly dry, like this, it, it's not going to go very far. Okay, that, this is too dry to bloom right now, so I'm not going to have a bloom, but I can put that new water on there, it dissolves the old, and that kind of smooths that out, and I can, I can push it and I can pull it. Okay, this is mechanical now. This is not the water doing it, this is me pushing it around with a brush, okay? That's the situation where actually you're controlling it rather than water. Most of the time you put the water on there and you just have to know how much water is on the brush, how much water is on the paper. Is the, is the water or the paint going to go from the brush to the paper? Now, if you, if you have a wash down there and you have a brush with too little water and too little pigment, you put it on, that's all going to silk up into the brush because the hairs in the brush have all these little capillary spaces and it's like a sponge and it, and it sucks stuff up off the paper. It's what they call a thirsty brush. You, make, you can really do it this way and it's extreme. It sucks up a lot of paint. A lot of times you do it unintentionally because you do a lot of this and you get it dry enough that it's going to suck water out from the paper because there's more on the paper than there is on the brush. On the other hand, uh, if you have a, a moderate mix of water and color on the paper, and you've got a lot of water in the brush but not enough pigment, whoa, the water will go down off the brush onto the paper, and then the paper will suck out that water, and it'll spread. In the extreme case, it'll bloom. So you have to have the right mixture of paint and water on the brush, and a little bit more of it that's on the paper, than is on the paper because that's all the only way it's going to transfer to the paper from the brush. What happens when people get those heavy edges is they're, they're getting a lot of water and a fair amount of paint, but the brush is all pretty wet. And their paper is damp. I mean, they've got this kind of sludgy stuff on the paper. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You've been working for half an hour and the paper's kind of spongy. And so then you take this brush that's loaded with all kinds of stuff and you put it in there, and what happens is all of a sudden, instead of the area where you put the brush down getting darker with more pigment, it actually looks lighter. You notice that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm fighting with that. And that's because you got a lot of water on the brush and, and some pigment, and that all runs down onto the paper, and since the paper isn't wet enough, it immediately gets soaked out away from where you put the brush. It takes the pigment with it. Takes the pigment with it. 
So you're doing the opposite of what you want. You're trying to darken it. Instead, it's getting lighter, but these edges, meanwhile, are getting darker and darker because these washes dry at the edge faster than they dry in the middle because that's where they're exposed to the dry paper in the air is at the edge, okay? All this stuff's drying out at the edge. Mm -hmm. And then we do more and more and more. And you do more and more and more, and it keeps going, keeps drying at the edge, and that edge keeps sucking up water and paint until you've got this black. sticky black thing out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I want to do now, we have a, quite a digression here, I'm going to paint a, this a sort of background color on this water. Okay, everywhere there's going to be a cliff reflection, I'm going to go ahead and put in a, a sort of a brownish wash. Okay, and I'll start out in the middle because that's that'll be easier. Now, one of the things you're going to find is you think, well, you know, I need to, to make a big wet wash. You can actually break this up into a series of little wet washes. It's nice and controllable. Uh, because if you look down here, you have all these sort of vertical wavy stripes. And you don't have to be real fussy about how they go. But it does help to paint them wet. Generally speaking, if you want to paint water, you paint it wet. Okay, and I can, I can just pick a place at random and I can go down and I can, you know, do little wiggles at the bottom where I try to get to whatever that frequency of wiggle is over here. But it's, it's not really crucial because I'm just going to start at the next one and I'll just do this. Okay, you know, it's... Sort of zen, you need to become one with the waves. <laughs> and you're keeping your edge off of the other paint so that it doesn't pull or run into that? No, it's right on the it's other. It's right one. on it? Sure. Why do you bother to wiggle? Uh, because it might leave a mark that's sort of semi-permanent. Uh -huh. And in fact, it's a good thing if it does because it has all these, all these little wiggles help give the impression Plus, it's fun. You know, <laughs> let's get real. You know. if, this, if it's not fun pushing the paint around, then, you know, you, why are you here? You know, it's not. So, what color are you using right now? Just burnt sienna. Okay. Because that burnt sienna was the background color of this whole thing, right? It's what we put on first up here. That's what we're putting on first down in the water. See, it's, it, it's got that sort of subtle wiggliness, but nothing real crucial. Uh, all I'm trying to do right now, really, is get that white paint or white paper covered so I get a better idea of what the composition is going to look like. Uh, when I was young and taking art lessons, they always used to talk about getting the whites covered because white surface is so distracting to you that sometimes you can't really tell what color things are. these areas later on, since they're reflecting this, are going to be very dark, they're kind of black up there. And then you have all these reflections of these shadow areas that are almost black. But right now I'm just covering up the white areas. This is not rocket science here. Okay, I'll give up on the wiggles. Near the horizon, instead of, you don't really see the wiggles, you mostly see these vertical stripes. Um, it's it's as, it, as it comes out at you that yeah. they increase. Right. Well, as they're closer, because, you know, the waves look bigger because they're closer to you, so the spacing is wider as you come down towards the bottom of the picture. That's the perspective. Up here, you know, you probably don't realize, but this rock is probably a half a mile from where the boat was. A long way away, and so you not you don't see all these little individual waves that far away. You're leaving a white line there for a reason. Um, 
Well, actually, if it's a sunlit picture like this, a lot of times you see little white sparkles where the water's on the rock. I don't see them here, but I usually scratch them out with a razor blade a little bit, just a few of them, but it's not going to make any difference in the long run because we'll be going back at the horizon and painting, painting in the horizon uh, wherever we decided it had to be based on the wave spacing. As I said, I tend to move the horizon up and down a little bit because maybe I haven't gotten the perspective exactly right and I'll decide oh, it needs to go up a little or it needs to go down a little. Uh, uh, in particular right now, I think it's going to need to go up. And I think that since this cliff is a fair amount further away than this one, the horizon line is going to be a little bit higher up, probably about here. That'll be my new horizon. Now, I can do this because the water, for the most part, is going to reflect whatever color's up there anyway, so that the fact that this area of the water is almost the same color as the rocks is no problem. That's why people are always asking questions about the horizon, and I say, yeah, don't worry about it, because nothing really is happening there, for the most part. I mean, this has these blue stripes, but I can lift them out and put them in later. Um, it's a kind of a general compositional rule that if you have a line, you don't like to put it smack across the center of the picture. But, but it I just do needs it. to be absolutely straight, right? I do it. Um, well, not absolutely, because you may have a rock a little closer to you. Okay. So, you know, but, but people, if they see any difference in the photograph, they tend to exaggerate it a lot. Now, your eye's very sensitive, and in your brain, you tend to exaggerate any little deviations from, from straight. Uh, but as I said, you're not supposed to put any, say, horizon line in the center of the picture. And, but I do it very frequently, and it drove my daughter nuts. <laughs> she said that, and, you know, and she said, I can't figure out why it doesn't look bad, because you're just not supposed to do that. And I said, think about it. I said, okay, you, you've got a picture here, and if you look at the horizon and you mask it off top and bottom, nothing is happening there because the water is reflecting exactly what's above it, so there's really no contrast. Oh, it's because of the reflection. And the structures right? yeah. even follow yeah. down yeah. into the water because there's usually these stripes. Yeah, the foreground. So that whole area right? doesn't yeah. really have a sharp line yeah. across it. It's not really definite. But it's just a function of the reflections, really. It's because yeah. the water's reflecting yeah. what's right above it. So I told Jenny, I said, nothing's happening there. Okay, the horizon's there, but nothing's happening at the horizon. If you back away from the picture, you really don't see much going on there. You look at um, the background or the foreground. Yeah, you're looking. The, you're looking at these. You're looking at these patterns up here, and then the wiggly patterns down there. And what's in between is just this third of the paper that's sort of vertical stripes in the distance, and you can't really tell where the horizon is. And the odd thing is that when you're actually out there in person, a lot of the times it can give you a little bit of vertigo because once in a while you'll be in a boat doing something and you'll look up and the way the reflections are, it's, it's like startling trying to figure out, okay, where, where am I? Stopping, yeah. Even when the water is perfectly still like a mirror and you see all these weird kaleidoscopic patterns there, uh, sometimes it can be very disorienting. Okay, now I've been talking away to hopefully uh, get this a little bit drier, but I'll still have to use the hair dryer. just then. I mean, I'm not worried about any blooming. It's way too dry for that. Uh, but I can feel the paper and it was still cool and it's soft. You know, if you paint on a picture and you, you, you've been painting for half an hour, an hour, like people do in the same area, 
uh, it's, it's just so soft you could take your fingernail and just pull up the paper like this. You shouldn't be painting on paper that's that soft because you damage it with the brush strokes. But you know if you leave it overnight and come in the next morning, it's, it's just hard and nice and sort of crisp looking. Uh, a lot of times I will leave a painting overnight. You know, I've worked on an area, I don't want to touch it again that day because I want the paper to dry out. So I just use the hair dryer to speed that up so that I can put these dark areas in without actually damaging the paper because it's not quite so soft now that I use the hair dryer on it. That makes sense to everybody? I know everybody's going to continue to go ahead and paint on soft paper because I'll be working across the room with somebody else and it's just too much of a temptation, you know. You, you just got to do it. Nothing against you. No. But uh, that's a good reason to do four versions, too, because you can set one version aside while, it, while the paper dries and recovers from really? your ministrations. <laughs> and uh, then by the time you do the fourth version, the first one will be drying out again, so you can go back and pound on it. So, uh, well, you know, I'm just being realistic about what's happening. Here. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna. This has these sort of horizontal blue stripes, where, as I said, the uh, the wind has kind of ruffled the surface of the water a little bit, and it makes these ripples and it reflects the sky where it would normally reflect just this cliff. So I'm going to try to reproduce that purple. I may later on change both colors a little bit, but uh, for now I'll try to make them match. And uh, I'm just going to put it right on there. This is fairly wet wash. Someone lent me ultramarine because I didn't have any. So I'm going to ask whoever lent me ultramarine to lend she's, me some more. She's <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm sure I have a tube of it here somewhere. But, uh, I guess I'll owe you a discount for I'm going to worry about it. <laughs> okay, yeah, you, you keep track of it because I won't. Okay, and it's mostly I'm just putting ultramarine and a little bit of red down there, but it's going on top of that layer of uh, burnt sienna. So it's not going to be quite a clear purple. It's going to be a little bit toned down. Anybody still back in the back? I can't see. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, way back. Way back. Way back. Well, can, can, who, can whoever is way back that's see your what wife. I'm doing? No, it's just Priscilla and Nancy. Oh. No students back there. Okay, well. Okay, and I'm carrying this down since these little stripes here are reflecting that cliff. I'm going to put, paint them all the same color. And as I said, I, I will be going over this later. May change the color, I may do this, may do that, whatever. But what's going to happen is that every time I go over it, I'm going to have to push the edge out a little bit past where the original edge was because I want to keep that very sharp to give the illusion of water, smooth water reflecting things, this sort of uh, glassy water, 
you need very sharp edges between the cliff reflection and that blue sky reflection. And to keep those sharp edges, if you know you're going to be going over an edge a couple times, every time you do it, you've got to go a tiny little fraction of an inch past the other one. So that way the new wash dissolves the old one and you get a new sharp edge. So you need to realize when you start these things that these reflections of the cliff are going to continually grow. And you need to make allowance for that by making them fairly narrow to start with. A lot of people have trouble with that. And what happens is eventually all the water turns black because they've just, you know, painted over and over and over and not quite gotten the right geometry or pattern in the first place. And every time they correct it, these areas get bigger. And then sooner or later, that's all there are. Okay, now there's going to be some vertical stripes up there. But okay, and here's the approximate reflection of that. It's a little too red, not quite blue enough. Now down here, towards the bottom, you can see that we have these interesting patterns of kind of whoosh, goes like so, you know. And... Um, I'm not going to try to wing it. I think I'll go ahead and uh, draw them in with a pencil. Just roughly, because I want the same spacing and general character as what I did with these waves over here. So for instance, this stripe here, I'll draw sort of a center line, comes down like that. And I'm going to follow the curve of the end of these waves. So I get the same spacing, roughly. See, it's just as though I took this pattern and I moved it straight over. Okay, now up towards the horizon, basically, we have a vertical stripe that's identical to what's above it. And then I start little wiggles, and I drew those indicator lines so that I can make these wiggles follow the same spacing of what's above it. I've got a lot of pencil lines on here now. I may need to borrow somebody's name and erasers. You've got them right there. I came on a, oh, that's right, I, I broke that off, I remember now. I'm just sort of shamelessly stealing all the students' supplies. I'm supposed to be the other way around. Oh well. Okay, now there's obviously there are sort of paler stripes and patterns within this. Now, I can lift those out later on if I want, but. Uh, for now, I'm just trying to get a general indication of what the pattern is here. Uh, the general rule for paintings is that if the picture's got a good compositional structure, uh, all the basic shapes are interesting and the colors and the values and everything else, the picture's going to look pretty good if you don't overwork it. Uh, whether you have any fine details in there or not. Uh, on the other hand, if the picture doesn't have a good structure to it, you can spend as long as you want on details and it's never going to look really good. So what you want is a picture that has good bones to it, you know, a pattern that's pleasing and catches the eye. And that's why I'm doing a, a rough sketch of these things before I ever get down to painting any of the details. And I, chances are I won't put that many details in. I know a lot of these prints that I have out there, they look very detailed, but if you look at them really close, the details are in certain areas. And then the rest of it, a lot of times, is just kind of rough. But you don't notice because 
if you're clever enough, you can draw somebody's eye to a certain area on the picture. And the rest of it's fine, because it's sort of out in their peripheral vision. You don't have to have a lot of details there. Um, Isn't that your goal as an artist, to pick a spot, force the uh, viewer's eye to a section? That's my goal. I'm not quite sure. Some people, you wonder how they do it, because the whole picture seems to have details, but it still looks kind of cool. Um, but they usually have sort of overall dramatic patterns to them anyway. I'm trying to think of... Uh, <laughs> well, one of my grandsons, I thought, okay, that kid's uh, going to be different. Uh, when he was very young, he picked a favorite artist, was Gustav Klimt. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with Klimt. <laughs> that's an odd one to take for a little kid. <laughs> uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> that's an odd choice. But Klimt has a lot of these paintings of, of women with robes or whatever. I remember one was that picture of Judith with the head holding the, you know. Beautiful picture, though. But what he did was he used the, the, this sort of gold paint on these very intricate patterns on all the cloth. And the painting has this, it's like a brocade almost. You look at the whole painting, but it has an overall, in addition to all these details, it has an overall pattern to it that's really eye-catching. Uh, but I remember, as I said, when my grandson Kai said that, I thought, oh, well, that's, uh, that's unusual. <laughs> I don't know what's going what's gonna to happen there. So these should be pretty much similar waves. I mean, you're kind of... You have to match matching. the spacing of whatever's out here. See, okay. this matches that. Oh, okay. This matches that. Now, as you go across the painting, they can shift a little bit up or down, and the patterns can change. But the overall spacing has to mirror, echo what's beside it. Otherwise, it looks, um, it doesn't look quite wavy. Um, you need to understand the sort of general principle when you're, when you're making up these kind of wave patterns, that if you have a, a few waves in the water, and they're reflecting some complicated thing above it. Just because the wave goes from reflecting a shadowed area to a light area doesn't mean the wave disappears. A wave will continue, I mean the same wave will continue through the light and dark areas, and you have to have a feeling of that continuity of, of the shape of the water, even though it's reflecting different things. And that may sound subtle, but it's really important and it's really difficult. That's why uh, quite frankly, one of the most difficult things in art, I mean, other than maybe um, painting people or figures, especially if they're in motion, you know, it can be very, very hard. Uh, making up an abstract pattern in the water like this uh, and making it interesting but still making it look convincingly real is a really hard job. A lot of people, you know, they get frustrated doing this and they, they start to try to copy in great detail. Copying this kind of pattern in, in meticulous detail is going to drive you absolutely but nuts. They definitely are so, interlocking, right? So you don't have point to point, you have... Yeah. Well, uh, I, I will make, you know, sort of gradual uh, alterations to my pattern. But as I said, I'm starting out fairly pale and tentative here. Uh, but I'll show you uh, in a minute what I'm talking about. Because it's almost time for you guys to start this. So. As I said, okay, I'm, I'm uh, putting this in fairly pale. Like, for instance, here. Uh, I know... And I'm going to want that. This is kind of an orangey color there. It's pretty bright. So I'll start out with that. And that's a little too intense, I think. And there. And this is the bright area. I sort of reversed things. I should have gone the other way around. But, um, okay, this stripe for this dark area. I'm gonna need to put out some more burnt sienna. 
and I'll put these in tentatively with the wiggles and everything else. Uh, but then I'll be changing the patterns. Now, because this is such a complicated pattern, the fact that you've left a, a wiggle, as long as it's sort of the right frequency and spacing, the interlocking, overlapping wiggles are going to look fine. So I'm not too worried about the exact details. Uh, I'm putting things in fairly tentatively at first because I know I'll be changing this pattern. But I do want to get that spacing approximately right, because that's not going to change. And it has to be exactly underneath the rock, right? It, it yeah, does yeah, have yeah, to, yeah, a dark yeah. area is going yeah. to have to follow exactly underneath yeah. it, yeah. Well, what happens is that they tend to be elongated, okay? There's just one short little dark area there, but it kind of spreads out. Um, here's another dark area over here. And we'll be working on this for uh, all of today and maybe even some of tomorrow. Um, because it's, this is the difficult part. This is the hard part. Um, and it will be very frustrating. And it, it may make you want to quit too bad. You're not allowed to. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much if it's not quite what you want, if you don't feel like you've gotten a finished picture out of it, because chances are you won't. Okay, now I got these wiggles here, and they follow, as I said, uh, approximately the frequency, the same spacing of, as these waves out here. But I look, for instance, uh, up here, I have a light area that's within a dark. Two, and then I have a dark up here, and I put light down here below it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, now this light area is going to be reflected down in the water right below it. I know that. Sooner or later, I'm going to see this dark area reflected down in the water. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start connecting these dark areas in here, like that. Say, okay, and that's going to leave me with these two little, little island reflections of this light area. And just pull a couple of these across like that. Okay, everybody see what I did there? Now, up here, there's this big dark. I know I'm going to have a lot of dark up there, so I'll say, okay, this should be mostly dark here with just this light stripe that reflects pretty much below this one and it'll be wavy as it comes down towards me. So I'll go ahead and I'll just put dark in there. That's for this dark here. And th this is a kind of a mental gymnastics thing because you're gonna forget what was light and dark and what you're trying to do. It's gonna, it will drive you nuts. Um, it even drives me nuts, and I've been doing this for 30 years. So you're not so much looking at that water. You're looking at this. I'm not looking this at this. I'm not, I have know. not looked at the reference photograph. You're just... I know okay. that whatever spacing I got in this, right. I have to have over here. So this may not actually have been accurate from the reference photograph to start with. But if this is not accurate, and then I go make a perfectly accurate one over here, the picture's going to look like crap. Okay. Because half of it isn't going to match the other half. Mm -hmm. So at this point, what I'm trying to do is be true to the picture that I've already started to paint. And at this point, it will start to diverge some from what's happening up there. Uh, but you know, you have one big block here, but you don't mm -hmm. have one, one wave. These are really... These are all separate waves. Yeah. In other words, there may be a, a wave that goes all the way across here, okay? Uh, you won't necessarily see it the same color all the way across because part of it will reflect this, part will reflect that, or, you know. Um, what you generally tend to have, though, for instance, if there is a reflection of this light area down here. Okay, here I got a white blob. Mm -hmm. That'll be a reflection of this later area, I know, as time goes on. Now, if there's a wave continues across, that same space right across from there is going to be reflecting this light area because of 
this reflects that position, then adjacent to it is going to have to be one that reflects this position. I mean, it's, um, uh, I hate to be techie. If, if you were a math student, you would call this conformal mapping, um, which is a fancy word meaning that if uh, uh, this color is adjacent to this color up here. It's going to have to be adjacent to it down here, too. It may be a totally distorted, changed shape, but, you know, the dark blue will have to be against the light thing. And this blue and that light are going to have to be against each other in a reflection in different spots. You may see this, this area right here that has this blue and that brown may be reflected half a dozen times in different spots right below that because of the waves. But they're always going to have to have this color adjacent to that color. Um, and as I said, it will drive you crazy because it's, it's a random pattern that you have to reproduce in your head uh, by making it up. Uh, in other words, what's happening here, for instance, you could program a computer with waves in it and say to the computer, okay, when the water's in your computer models at a certain angle, it's gonna reflect a certain position. And you can make this, this computer animation model that will do this pretty well. Well, in this case, the computer that's doing it's gotta be up here. And you just have to have a feel after a while. I mean, a lot of my, if I analyze a lot of the pictures that are actually the best pictures, they're not necessarily scientifically accurate that this would be reflected there and vice versa, but, but they're convincing because I know certain rules are the important ones and I've, over the years, just kind of gotten the hang of that. Uh, it takes a lot of practice. Um, you will, at first, I'm sure, do better starting out by copying pictures that have very simple patterns. See, now I screwed that up because that really shouldn't be that wide. This isn't that wide. Now, a lot of times when you do that, you think, oh dear, I can't shrink that in the water. I got a reflection that's bigger than that. Well, nobody knows where this place was or what size the rocks were, so I say, okay, no problem. Now the rock <laughs> reflection is that wide. Now they, now they match. Okay, now, now I'm okay. Uh, but they do have to match if you get a wide stripe down here and a narrow stripe up so there. So that's one of the rules, yeah. Yeah, you, you, one of the rules is if you have to cheat, cheat. Because, you know, it's, it's got to look right regardless of whether it's accurate. You're, you're not after the truth here, you're after what you would call verisimilitude. You know, you're trying to be convincing even when you're lying. Which is why, you know, you never really trust an artist any more than you trust a politician, because it's your job to lie a little bit. Uh, it's all an illusion. Yeah, you know, and if you're, if you're too honest, well, too bad, you know, it's... <laughs> if you're too honest, people are going to look at it and say, hey, you know, I could have taken a photograph, why should I spend all that money for that picture? If you're if you're just creatively dishonest, people look at it and think, "Hey, that's pretty cool." <laughs> you know, I don't, it looks convincing, but I know it isn't. Can, can I ask you in, in in photography, the yeah. the uh, surface of water that's reflecting the landscape mm -hmm. is like a f stop and a half uh, darker than the actual landscape. Yeah, you, you have to put do you have to do a little longer exposure for the reflection than you do for the thing that's reflecting. Right. Do, do you so need to address that here? Uh, yeah, because what's going to happen is these areas will wind up darker than those. Everything, all these reflections are going to wind up a little darker than what's in the mm -hmm. cliff, especially as you come down towards you if you've actually done that. In photography, you'll know that not only that, is it an f-stop different, if you're looking real far down in here and the light's not hitting the water directly, it'll be like two F stops different, or it will just show up black. Right. Um, a lot of times, I have seen photographs where people will take a photograph of a mountain lake that's an absolute mirror image. 
And occasionally, I've seen them framed or printed, whether deliberately or not, upside down. Mm -hmm. And you can always tell that they're upside down because if the top half is darker than the bottom half, they made this thing upside down, you yeah. know, even before you start looking for the little ripple. Uh, but like I said, the thing is, if you paint exactly like the photograph, uh, people don't find that as interesting as when you've done something that's obviously sort of abstracted, but it's mm -hmm. just as convincing. I mean, there was a fellow, I was in a, in a summer research thing one time in high school, and we were all egotistical young idiots, you know. Uh, thought we were real hot shit intellectually, and there was this one kid, uh, I won't name names in case there are any environmentalists here that like this guy, but he's, he's a well-known guru in the environmental community now. And he, even back then, I mean, they, <laughs> the professors used to call him Mr. Snowjob, but He's a he, you know, real high IQ kid, and, uh, but he just couldn't stick to the simple facts. And we had to, this day when parents came up to visit, this was in Schenectady in New York, GE ran it. And uh, he and I were sort of supposed to be the, the two hot shots in this group. And uh, so we all had lunch together this guy and his parents and my parents. And my father was just high school education, but he had about 30 patents. He was a smart guy. And we're all there having lunch and talking, and this fellow's kid's talking about various things and stuff. We came away from lunch, and my father kind of shook his head, and he, he was, it was a sort of admiring, uh, he, he just had a smile on his face, and he said, you know, he said, that kid is the most artistic bullshitter I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> He said, he's going to go far. He's good at that, <laughs> you know. And that's the thing. If you're an artist, that's what you're really after. You're after the impression that it gives. Not, you're not trying to be absolutely literal. You want to, the best portrait in the world looks like somebody and you think you've painted them warts and all, or they think they do, but there's something that makes them just look better and you can't figure out why, you know. That's a real good portrait painter, you know. I mean, a mediocre portrait painter will get something that kind of looks like somebody, but maybe not quite. And then a good portrait painter will get a picture that looks exactly like somebody, and they'll say, well, that's really like that person, you know. Uh, but the real genius portrait painters can paint a picture of somebody who's, say, fairly old, and you'll say, well, that's that exact person, just as they are now, and yet there's something about it that you can also see what they look like when they were younger, and they just look a little better, and you don't know why, because you think all the wrinkles are there, but there's something about the way they're presented that's not quite like if you just took a photograph, you know yeah, what I mean? John Singer Sergeant. Yeah, well, that's basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing yeah. Sargent, although Sargent also said, somebody asked him to define a portrait, and he said, it's a painting where there's a little bit something wrong with the mouth. <laughs> because if you've ever painted portraits on commission, you know, you cannot please people. And if his paintings couldn't please somebody, you know that, he, you know. There's no pleasing them. That there's no pleasing them. Okay, so all I really wanted to do was get this overall pattern. And you can see what I did here. I don't know. It's upside down for the camera monitor now, isn't it? Okay. Uh, yeah, and, just left it up the way you have to. Now turn around. Yeah, leave it there for me. And, uh, oh, here we go. Excuse me. Anyway, the patterns in the water are starting to develop. As I said, they start out as stripes, vertical stripes, straight down from what's above them. And, but then you have to kind of get creative. And I did not follow the exact photograph because I can't. I mean, it, we would be here for a month and a half while I painted in every little thing. 
what I'm trying to do is get something convincing. Uh, and all of those prints I have there, the, all those patterns in the water are strictly fictional. But they look real wet, you know, looks real slick. Some of those photographs that I worked from actually had like windy days where the surface of the water was real rough. And, and I just said, oh, the hell with that. I like it when it looks shiny in the morning. So I changed it. And you can make it up if you've done it a whole lot. But even if you haven't done it a whole lot and you're copying a photograph that has neat looking patterns the way this one does, you're still not going to be able to follow those exactly. So what you're going to have to do now is be a little creative about trying to make a pattern that looks convincing and kind of like this one, but without all the work of trying to measure everything and duplicate it exactly. Okay. So what I want you to do is go put this background burnt sienna across everywhere you're going to have ripples, and then I'll to draw where you think these ripples are going to be over here, and I'll come around and check the drawings before you start on the painting. Don't don't get in too much trouble okay, without me with the paintings. Yeah, because we're going to be doing this for a while. So if we're still lacking development in, in the it, if you if you roughly have the dark and light areas, that's going to be good enough. Because, uh, for instance. Um, Say this this little spot here where this comes down, uh, you're not even going to see that down in here. So you don't worry about all those details. You worry that you got a block of this color here and a block of that color there and a stripe of that color and a stripe of that color. And it, it's you're only seeing the very rough reflection anyway. You can't cover the top of this picture and look down here and in your brain reconstruct what that pattern is up there. I mean. I know that I could do it with a computer, and I know how to do it, but in practice, I can't do it in my head. Yeah. You know, That's not figures. what we want to do, though, is it? It's not what we want, right? We want, we don't want, we want a little abstract you, in our stuff, right? Exactly. Take a photograph. That's, that's, that's the that's whole point. You yeah, you, you want it to be abstracted anyway, but, but as I'm saying, nobody is going to know exactly how many ripples? How many ripples or, or what little spot this is reflecting. But it has to be convincing. I mean, it has to be the same color, roughly the same amount of, of area covered by one color and another, and it has to follow some ripples. Uh, but you're making it up. Can I ask, when I yeah. look here, there's a line where this sketch comes down. And I'll I was probably curious do how that. you brought this farther out. Well, as I said, this is just a rough, yeah. a rough out. In other words, I will probably go in later and take a brush and do a little bit of lifting in some okay. line. It doesn't have to match anything in particular, but, you know, I'll try roughly to say that, okay, the, this light area here is a reflection of that. So probably do, you remember I painted this whole thing, I lifted that and I painted back in. I'll do the same order. I'll lift a little bit out and then I'll paint back in and, and it'll look convincing if I do it the same way with the same colors. But generally speaking, I will have, as I finish things up, say if I paint, if I take one of these rocks and I paint it up here, mm -hmm. when the picture's almost done, then I'll paint in the reflection of that water down here. So I can do that as I go along and gradually tweak it and make it more detailed. And you aren't going in with any real darks? Not yet, no, because I, that pattern is very hard to get a convincing pattern, so I'm sneaking up on it. Yeah. Yeah. 
across the border. So it comes in and what you want as you go along. And if you put more detail to your table, somewhere you put a sand or a rock. You have to get the full reflection and have a light that they get out of the water. I think it's worth it. Because our whole world has a continental brown. So like if I start with this, it's more of a rock sand in the background. We both of us have played a light. Yeah, if you use the most of the rock to be able to sit right there would be pretty cool. Uh, like so I would think you did come in here for Rosanna. How was he going to do that? I don't know. I don't know if you can do that either. Yeah. 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 We never make out well on those things. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I do. Thank you. 